afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to Saturday of fourth week here at the Oxford Union and the second event in our very exciting Smashing the Silos series. Now I'd like to ask Professor Glenn Parry to give his talk. Thank you so much, Professor. Welcome. Uh, as uh, Rob said, I'm uh, Glenn Parry. I'm Professor of Digital Transformation at the University of Surrey. Um, wh what I'll be talking about is, is some work we did uh, with a colleague at Bath on blockchain, looking at how blockchain can help in supply chains uh, and provide visibility. Um, I, I think there's, there's particular salience around this sort of topic at the moment, given uh, Brexit and, and trying to move stuff all over the world. Um, so this is, is based on this paper we published in Supply Chain Management, an international journal, um, and uh, we can make copies of that available. So just a, a summary overview, um, what are we talking about? Well, blockchain is finding application in food supply chains. I know most of you know blockchain as a, a maybe cryptocurrency based tool, um, but I'm really interested in non-financial um, non applications of it. Uh, what can we use it for? Well, the blockchain can be used as a source of verification of when and where exchanges occur. Uh, but there are challenges here. Uh, challenges remain, systems aren't perfect, and we'll go through some of those things. So this is our, our agenda, just to keep track of where we are. We'll talk about traceability, traceability and visibility and why it's important in a supply chain. I'll give you a, a brief overview of what is blockchain and how can it help? I know some of you are probably deeply expert, but there's others who, who maybe have just heard about it. We'll go through a small number of case studies we've undertaken with firms who are actually developing and using blockchain technologies. Take you through some of the key learning that we've taken both for academia and practice and some of the next steps and, and maybe we'll talk about where we're going next. Traceability is, is sort of passive tracking and it's legally required in some industries. Traceability is this ability to identify where or not item came from and the records of it throughout a supply chain. Um, you may remember the food scandals in the 1990s, uh, which actually drove introduction into a lot of traceability. The, the horse meat scandal in the UK was probably uh, most well known. But traceability enhances product security, provides process control, but doesn't necessarily address other key risks, materials used, process employed, people engaged. It's also passive. Um, it just allows you to know where an item is, to, to track. It provides you some, you know, what happened. It, the data follows the product, doesn't show you where it's going maybe, doesn't show you where it went. It doesn't give you information about what's happening at a point in time. So it, it is this passive, it, it's more difficult to be reactive to it. Beyond that in, in supply chain theory, we talk about visibility. And this can be defined in a number of ways, but visibility is a firm's ability to access data that allows them to see into their supply chains. And we, in supply chain theory, we really talk about three characterizations of visibility. We talk about exchanges or sharing. So we say, you know, you, you enhance your visibility when you exchange data between parties. We talk about the properties of that data. Is it accurate, trusted, timely, useful? And what format does it come in? I mean, often when you're working in, you know, moving stuff around the world, you get a PDF and then you've got to read it. It's not terribly dynamic. Um, it's really visibility that, that interests me is it this last one. It's the ability for information to drive action, the attention paid, the highlights, the exceptions in supply chain execution that facilitates action. So really, do you, am I being given data that I can act on, that I can change things so I can sort my, my supply out dynamically? So that's really what we want to move towards. Supply chain visibility, when you get there, does improve firm performance. Well, you can get better inventory management. You can therefore drive higher sales. You get a better understanding of demand because supply chain is, is forward as well as back. Uh, I did a, a load of work in the music industry, and one of the things we realized was uh, some of the, the record companies weren't actually getting visibility of sales. You just get that, that you know, Ipsos Mori or whoever's done the charts. That's your sales data. You're not getting true point of sales data. 
and this is why the internet is quite a wonderful thing. When you get streaming, you can see what people are actually engaging in. And it's a really good measure of popularity. And it gives you all the different genres. That's really great supply chain visibility if you can get the data. Being able to see what's happening across supply chain reduces your risk in decision making. The visibility gives firms more confidence in acting. They can reconfigure your supply chain and you, you can therefore create much better strategic value for the firm. So again, traditional supply chains really struggle with visibility. Often it's led by a large firm, centralized control, maybe information, but, but often we talk about information asymmetries where one firm holds all the data. They're not very good at sharing it. They don't necessarily have open APIs and really things could be done a lot better. Um, this information asymmetry is, is driven by legacy IT systems and often that prevents future optimization because you really you say, well, can I put an API on that? And then, oh, well, that'd be very expensive because our system's just not set up for it. So it's difficult and it also demands a degree of collaboration. And you can imagine when you've got a large firm asking a smaller firm, can you give me inventory data? I want to know, you know, what your goods in and goods out looks like. Well, if I know that, I've probably got a good idea of your sales. And that then puts me in a better position when it comes to negotiating price because I can beat you up because I can say, oh, I know you didn't get very good sales. So there's all sorts of political issues uh, that sit behind, you know, what might appear quite a simple topic. And when we move to uh, these supply chain solutions, often we we have to link the physical digital world together. Um, now, you're probably all familiar with uh, barcodes, uh, very low cost. It's just a number, 12, 12 digit number uh, that you can get from a barcode. More recently, well, more recently in my lifetime, <laughs> more recently, uh, QR codes. This is two I mentioned, you get a lot more information. You can, you can link it to websites and applications. So you're probably used to seeing those. Uh, RFID tags, uh, you can have them as passive or active, and then you can really start to write data into those. Uh, they are more expensive because, you know, you're putting a little copper coil or, or even if it's an active RFID, it might even be powered and, and beaming data out. So they can be active or passive. So these are the sort of things that we use to link physical and digital worlds. Um, more recently still, Internet of Things. This is where we put smart devices, captured data. I mean, what you're looking at there is a motion sensor that also has a um, temperature sensor, a light reading on it and a motion sensor. So if you put that on something, you can you can see that, you know, we've got motion, we've got temperature, we've got luminosity. Uh, and then you can really start to get some detailed information about what's happening to that product. You know, if it's a case of wine traveling around the world, knowing its temperature at all points, you know, if it's particularly expensive wine and you can see the temperatures going up or going down beyond your limits, you could suddenly make that phone call and say, ah, save my wine shipment. So what is blockchain and how can it help? There's a lot really spoken about blockchain and uh, particularly in the popular uh, press and online, and it's nearly always linked to, you know, Bitcoin and blockchain, which are, you know, wonderful things. Blockchain is actually the specific Bitcoin variant of a distributed ledger technology. It's become the generic term for DLT, distributed ledger. Fundamentally, when people say, what is it? I say, it's just a list that's difficult to change. That's what blockchain creates for you. It creates a list of things that's very difficult to change. There's numerous different ways of having blockchains, distributed ledgers. You can have public ones, which is the Bitcoin thing, but you can also have private ones, or you can also have public-private ones, the hybrids. Also, you don't have to create your own. There are those out there in, you know, you, like websites and things, you can, you can just upload your stuff onto somebody else's blockchain. Data in blocks, so the data you upload can theoretically be anything. Um, usually you have a limit to how much data goes in a block. So you need to choose your, your blockchain, the one you use accordingly. Bitcoin is officially limited to one meg. 
they're actually quite small amounts of data. It isn't perfect. Speed is a key problem. Bitcoin network can process three to seven transfers uh, per second at maximum capacity. So you're writing blocks at that sort of rate. If you compare that to Visa, the, the credit card company, they're looking at 1,700 transactions per second. So you've got this massive issue at the moment on, on the latency of the network. And there are many other you know, issues around using blockchain. And that's just one to consider. How it works, well, this is my very simple sort of explainer for those who, who don't really understand how it works. And this is only a how it works sort of. Uh, there's a link uh, underneath that slide. My, my colleague, Professor Colomas, has, has produced this 48, I think it is, minute video on YouTube that explains all you'll ever want to know. He's the, the techie guy on this, um, but he's part of the, the decade center. You can have a look at that. But this is sort of how it works. So you start off with your Genesis block, your first block, and that's dated. You have some data, which is your transactions. You know, at person A sends eight, whatever it is, Bitcoins to person B or cases of wine. Person B sends four of these things to C. And then we enter this value. This is what miners do. This value is called the nonce. That's a number that is used once. You've probably heard of miners. What they're doing is changing that, that number, that character string they're putting in. And what they're driving towards, they use the SHA algorithm in, in some cases, different algorithms are used. But that generates this, this in this case, a 32-bit uh, code. And that's unique to the data in that block. And what they do is they keep changing the nonce. This is mining. They keep changing that nonce until, in, in this case, they get eight zeros at the start of that unique code. And then once they've done that, that mine is blocked. They share that with the network. And the network can all put that nonce in based on that data set. And they'll generate the same hash value. It's a bit like forcing, if you remember those little tumblers you get on your old bike clock. This is how mining works. It's not that clever. It's, it's you know, forced. You, you sit there and you run loads and loads and loads of codes on your little bike clock. When you've got the code, it opens. Now, if you imagine everybody doing that, the first person to do it can shout, oh, the code is 359. And everybody typed in 359. It opens and you go, oh, yeah, that's your proof of work. You tell everybody, oh, my bike looks open. Tell everybody else, I've done it. I've done it. I'm first. Everybody checks and go, yeah, you've got the solution. Well done. And typically you get a reward for being first. So here we go. You know, every 10 minutes, this is written. And we say, oh, we've got a new block. Somebody solved it. We put the code of that as the first bit of information in a new block. We add transactions. We do our, our nonce value, hash it again. We do it again every 10 minutes. And you can see what this does is because you're putting the hash of the previous block in the new block as the first bit of data, more data, insert the nonce, hash again. This effectively locks the blocks together, hence blockchain. It's as simple as that. Hey, and to undo this, you have to, if you wanted to change data in block one, you actually have to unpick them all, put your new bit of data in and lock them all at a faster rate than all those people that are mining. Because this, this chain always moves forward and everybody uses the longest chain. So this is why it is a list of things that is difficult to change. So blockchain would appear to offer a solution to a demand for greater supply chain visibility. Why? Well, much research has gone into fintech. Here it's used as a ledger to record transactions. It's useful to have a list of exchanges. It's difficult to change. Customers are, and businesses are increasingly becoming socially aware. They want to know where's my product been, who sourced it, where it came from. Blockchain can record those characteristics but there's very few actual live cases. So my research question really was, how are firms using blockchain for supply chain visibility in food and what are the challenges they faced? So that's really what I wanted to know. So here's a, a small number of case studies that we found and I'll, I'll give you a brief overview. Uh, Agri-Digital, they were interested in verifying the organic status of grain. It's an Australian commodity provider. Their system offers the assurance that this is organic. So farmers on their farm collect a, a range of data. It's a little web application. 
Uh, they show the cereal, the fertilizer, the weather, uh, the production, how much was made, where it was stored, all that's recorded. And we, we put hashes of that data in the blockchain. You can then match the data to what's expected. You can verify that, you can go and visit, you know, you can check the weather status. All these assertions, what I've said, are hashed and recorded in a private uh, quorum blockchain. Then at the point of packaging, maybe you can scrutinize that. I mean, if, if you're packaging more grain than this guy's harvested, you know that you've got a faulty supply chain. So it's just, you know, you can look for exceptions. That's the sort of stuff you can do. Now, when we spoke to them, we said, what are your issues? And they said, well, human input corruption remains a challenge. Um, people really believe blockchain data, uh, but it may have been false upon entry. You know, blockchain brings this halo as truth, which some people then don't question the data like you normally would. And they said, actually, that's a problem because in many cases, these interfaces are somebody just typing something in. And technology can't fulfill the potential unless the supply chains are fully digital. There's big holes and it's farming. So there's big holes in the digital flow. And really we need to look at what are the new products and processes that we can develop simultaneously with technology? And in small networks, it's more of a thought exercise. We need big networks with lots of nodes on our blockchain to really enhance data volume and enhance security. So, you know, very small networks, you can see you can, you're not really building chains very quickly. People can tamper with it. So that's why, you know, you, you really want to stick that maybe on public blockchain uh, so that those chains are accelerating. TechRock, China had a problem with um, uh, fraud in baby food. People were, you know, using all sorts of unpleasant stuff and selling it as baby food. So TechRock came up with this anti-counterfeit assurance uh, for infant formula. Uh, products are smart tagged. You can see in the image there, there's a, a smart tag over the top of the can, a little QR code, and that's an RFID tag that's tamper proof. They used Hyperledger to record their data. So throughout, whenever this thing's moving, the RFID tag can be scanned. So you can say, you know, this is all the attributes of that. The QR code, even at the final point, the customer themselves can scan their can and they'll get an image on their phone and they'll go, yeah, this, this is what your can should look like. And you get a rag status sort of, yeah, this is a good can, you're all good. Obviously anybody tampering with that can, it breaks the RFID tag. And, you know, we, we know there's a problem. Um, Issues they spoke about was, well, there's, uh, it's costly. And OK, baby food, people are prepared to pay that price premium because, you know, they're looking to protect the baby. The price isn't necessarily such an issue. But when we try and move into other products, it's more difficult. We, you know, they found they can go to vitamins and supplements, things with higher prices. But when you go to a lot of, you know, fast moving consumer goods, the price and margins are so small, it's difficult to put that technology on board. Uh, and in some markets, they say, look, you know, over promises has eroded trust. Um, it's difficult to achieve. World Wildlife Fund, this is fish, uh, <clears throat> illegal fishing in Western and Central Pacific. There's these massive fleets out there. And what we heard of was what we call modern slavery. Some people being you know, put on ships and being out there for years. Um, and, you know, those ships being unloaded at sea, uh, you know, so one ship transfers its catch to another, that ship bounces in and out of port but these other ships are just randomly roaming fishing everywhere <clears throat> so what this system does is it enables you to catch detail on on what's going on with that catch the location using gps maybe crew details catch logs what we call and where satellite tracking all of that detail is recorded we can automatically document a lot of that and move it onto a blockchain data shared via QR codes on pallets of fish let you let you audit that data and um, issues again you're looking at very remote locations with you know maybe no digital infrastructure so reliance on error and fraud most of these ships don't have this information on it blockchain again lacks data standards for input so we've got governance issues on how we actually upload this uh, and communication and learning transfer between trials is very difficult in these very remote areas. Final case, Dementor, supply chain for wine, which I'm sure we're all passionate about, um, getting our, our right wine, but it's massive fraud in wine. 
Um, what can we do? We can RFID tag, we can put that in the cork. So if you pull the cork, it breaks it. We put QR codes on the bottle. We're capturing data on growing conditions, great variety, storing this on a public Ethereum blockchain. We can use multi people uh, for every transaction to make sure that that data is secure. We use mass balance to make sure that the total transactions are actually possible. So you're not selling more bottles of wine than you ever could have produced. Um, so we, we're getting you know, some, some robustness in that. QR code, again, color coded response. So you can scan your bottle and go, yeah, that's a good bottle. You're okay with that. Problems again, the negative media around cryptocurrency has been a problem and ironically, the trust machine that's blockchain has a trust issue. And there's a lot of secrecy around people's blockchain trials. I mean, we've, we've struggled in some cases to get in to say, what are you doing? Because people can see that there's a commercial benefit here. But obviously, if we could all share, we could get open data standards uh, and maybe we could accelerate the, the, the possibilities of this technology. Evangelists for this all think everything should be on the blockchain. And, you know, it, that's not a good idea. Um, so we need to think really carefully. We want the minimal amount stuck onto a blockchain uh, because of the issues we talked about earlier. So our key learnings, blockchains provide some unit level supply chain data provenance, provenance, you know, sharing history. Case studies at each unit level show us the possibilities uh, the tracking provides visibility and data to inform action. We've got some good examples of that and how we can give confidence to consumers in, in the veracity of our products. So we, we are providing this visibility, which will hopefully drive greater profitability from these very customer centric offers. We're showing that, you know, one, one, one case we talked about was product recalls. We've got this great audit data now. So if we do ever have to do a product recall, we can do it much more effectively. And actually it's more like unlikely we'll do that because we can see what's happening and hopefully act before a faulty product or a bad product goes to market. So supply chain visibility and blockchains helping us make decisions. It's also building this perception of trust our case studies demonstrate assurance. We're providing transparency and this immutability, this you know, data that you can't change easily. We're holding process data, which is you know, made evident to auditors so we can show, look, this hasn't been forged. It's helping build our perception of trust. We're giving end-to-end -end digitization challenges still to be addressed. All our cases highlight this need for end-to-end -end digitization. For digital goods, uh, we did some work with digital art. The artifact itself is digital, so therefore it's amenable to this. We've got a problem with physical goods. Fully digitizing them is a problem. You always, you know, Kashirsky said, proposes that blockchain removes the requirement for tagging technologies. Maybe, you know, we're looking at the moment another case on, on using DNA markers. But we've found a reliance pretty much throughout on, on RFID and you know, barcodes, some form of physical tags, and that can always be swapped. This is the weakness. This is the key weakness is the digital physical boundary. So next steps. <clears throat> I'm, I'm really interested in applications of blockchain for good, you know, tackling modern slavery in cocoa, sugar, timber, cotton. And that's, you know, through enhanced audit, really. We're looking for longitudinal studies to see how this changes over time, how it differs with context, with institutions and the different people we work with. We're also interested in the inherent paradoxes that, that we see arising in blockchain. You know, there's claims for trustlessness, but you've got to trust this new system. And in some cases, you've got to trust all these anonymous people. Uh, so how's that trustless? Um, there's claims that, oh, blockchain disintermediates your supply chain but you've got new technology intermediaries. And again, depending on your blockchain, you might not know who they are. So we've got questions to consider. What is actually decentralized? Are we decentralizing data, trust, governance, attribution? What is this decentralization? How can we capture data reliably? Is there a trusted third party who can hold the data? Do you actually need this thing? Because if, if you really trust somebody, well, why do you need this list you can't change? 
And if you are employing a blockchain, what are you going to put on the block? What don't you need to do there? What blockchain will you actually use? Is it going to be public, private? Who takes part in this consensus? Who's going to be mining? You know, at the moment, if you take the Bitcoin blockchain, it's, it's a small number of massive Chinese firms. So how is that really helpful if, if, if they want to change something? Maybe they could. So this, this is the paper, if, if you want to have a look. Um, and, you know, I, I'm involved in a number of projects. You can find me online, Twitter and things, if, if you want to discuss. Oh, well, thank you so, so much. That, that was a really, really interesting presentation. And, and I, I certainly hugely enjoyed it. It's also a, uh, it's a very rare treat to have someone propose so many questions to be asked in some <laughs> Q&A section. I don't think that's happened before. So thank you for that. Um, Rather than, rather than diving into those though, there were just a couple of things I wanted to try and pull out first from, from, from the stuff you were discussing in the presentation, not least because um, I think I'm about 80% of the way there, but there's, there's just a bit more understanding I want to chase. Um, and maybe the first place to start is just around the physical digital layer um, and, and some of those challenges of, of recording information um, on a blockchain reliably. Um, whether we're talking about you know, modern slavery in remote regions and, and the chance to do enhanced audit around that, um, or if we're talking about the use of RFID tags by people like TechRock and Demeter. Um, I, I suppose as a start point, um, for my understanding, it strikes me that you know, the, the blockchain is very helpful in, in, in giving me faith that someone within these organizations hasn't changed the data on first input. But when it's actually putting that information in initially, you know, that's the point where we're still needing to have scrutiny. I, I, I don't know if that's fair or unfair. I'd be really interested in, in, in just hearing your thoughts around that more. That is absolutely one of the core problems we have to solve. Because, um, you know, you, you talk about this, this, this trust, but how do we get trust, you know, right at the start? Because if you don't get good data in, you're not going to get good data out. So you can have multiple parties inputting the data and things like weather data uh, can be, you know, third party data and GPS locations this sort of stuff for the fishing, you know, you can you can draw that in uh, the, the sort of mass balance stuff, making sure that you said you put this much, you know, cocoa into your, you know, chocolate beans in, into your system and that then you've made this much chocolate. Those two things, you can't make more chocolate from that many beans. That's just not possible. Um, and that then allows us to audit. So you can say, well, this is how big your field is. We know what the yields are likely to be. So it just becomes more difficult with the physical uh, things. The Internet of Things sensors that I mentioned, as those get more reliable, you know, we, we see people putting you know, webcams up. So then anybody can check in and look. Um, so you get this sort of oversight. Obviously, it remains a weakness. This is why we're looking at biomarkers at the moment. I find those really interesting. There's a lot of interesting case studies to look at. Um, one I'm uh, talking about the other day was Manuka honey, which I, is from New Zealand, and there's you know fraud in that. But actually, if you, you you look at can we extract the DNA from that and make a marker, it's obviously unique to it then, and then we can write that into the blockchain and pick it up at the other end. We've done that with uh, chocolate with cocoa, and you can actually take the DNA from the cocoa plants. And they, they are then, the marker that you create is unique to pretty much the field it's in. Even, even neighboring farms are different. And it's something to do with the, the local environment that influences that particular plant and the, the mark you end up with. Uh, and also when you move to the fermentation, because uh, I've learned quite a bit about how chocolate is made. Um, <laughs> Who knew you fermented chocolate beans? Um, but when you move to that stage, they're done in, in particular locations and those locations end up with particular uh, sort of biomarkers, bi biological uh, environments unique to that particular location because the environment impacts on it. And I was speaking to somebody who, who's from uh, food science and they're saying, yeah, actually we can do the same thing with uh, some lettuces and with milk where they, you know, collecting milk in those large containers, they tend to have this, you know, unique 
uh, biological signature. So we can say, oh yeah, that milk's from there because I've, I've got my, my little biomarker that tells me the, the, the unique, uh, whatever it is, biologics going on in, in, in that system. And then you write them to the blockchain and then you've, you've actually got something pretty solid. And, and with the chocolate, uh, the biomarker is really quite robust. So if you pick it up and you say, you know, this is a single source Ecuadorian chocolate bar from these farms. And, you know, you can go and audit those farms and, and say, you know, this is a fair traded farm and all, all this good stuff. We can actually then pick it up in a chocolate bar because it survives the processing. Some biomarkers don't because, you, you know, products are massively heated and things. But actually with the chocolate process, these biomarkers are robust. So you can actually take the chocolate bar from the shop stick it through the, the labs and they'll come back and say, yeah, that's 18% you know, this, 20% that, and it'll give you a breakdown, um, which is really, you know, that that's really amazing science. And you can imagine that if people got hold of that, then you're testing the veracity of where did that come from? And you really got some interesting stuff. I mean, uh, they get quite passionate about the whole chocolate thing, um, but we, it's not a new problem. Um, Chocolate uh, has, I think it's at 1800s or something. We found reports from Cadbury's saying that they got a problem with slavery and, and, and abuse a hundred years ago. <laughs> so we can't say, well, you know, it's a new problem. It's not. This has been going on a long time in sort of Ghana, Ivory Coast. These these, these problems to sort out, and um, maybe we can help here. So I suppose just to sort of draw something out of that, you, the mindset that we are approaching the trustlessness audit function of blockchain from is very much the mindset of, of government, of an auditor. It, it, it's, it's not necessarily that it's helpful for Cadbury's directly to be using blockchain to do this as much as the fact that if the government doesn't trust Cadbury's to not be tampering with its database to try and cover up nasties in the supply chain, then Cadbury's using a blockchain-based database might give them a little bit more comfort. Is, 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 is that a fair take? Um, well, I, no, I never like to blame blame the firms because, yeah, I always think, you know, when you know meet the firms, people are absolutely trying their best to sort this out. Um, and, you know, the big firms aren't, I never, you know, they're not malevolent. Uh, they're really trying to sort this, but it's a really difficult problem when you've got such a, a big supply chain where you've got you know what, hundreds of thousands of little farms spread in very remote regions and you, you, know, you may put put an order in to buy from a farm and then it, it goes through some centralization depot but where a lot of other stuff is brought together and then how do you know that what i've bought is still not contaminated with these other things when it's in another country unless you somehow send somebody there to watch all the time it, it, it's just incredibly difficult but using this sort of market technology we can do it and you know if you take the wine biomarkers in wine we might trust the the bottler is absolutely invested in making sure that you know the data they're putting in is right because it, it's the value of their brand but when that goes into a shipping container and disappears off there are other players in the market who are invested in making more of that because they say oh you know i'll sell 10 bottles to you and 10 bottles of you to you and, but at that point in the supply chain you only had 10 bottles you just sold 20 and it's picking that sort of thing up where it's often hidden and buried in in you know shipping containers being moved around the world so does that that almost points us towards um a way of disintegrating some of these large multinational integrated firms that we see today if, if, if currently if I want to track something in a, in a centralized software system from uh, the farm through to the consumer I pretty much need to be the same corporation keeping that in my database the whole way through and it can be an ordinary software database because I trust my employees not to tamper with the data without my knowledge whereas if you can get that data of record through a public blockchain, then you can maybe have a, a series of different specialist firms interacting with the same level of trust between each other as departments would have inside an organization with a shared software stack and software department. It, it, is that fair? Is that really one of the directions that from a corporate perspective, you know, we can drive this in? 
Yeah, I mean, it is these these multi organizational supply chains. I mean, very few firms can make everything. Yeah. So something. <laughs> I mean, when you sort of, you know, I'm not the, the modern slavery expert. That's that's uh, Mike Rogerson, my my one of my colleagues. Um, but you, when you start to look at what you wear, what you eat, uh, you know, with the building you're in, it's pretty difficult to get away from potentially problematic supply chains, timber, cotton, you know, f food, chocolate, <laughs> sugar. <laughs> it's, they're, you know, tiny little farms who are all working together, maybe centralizing to a location product, which is then moved between multiple middle parties before it even appears in, you know, some form of formal market where it then might get bought in bulk and centralized and turned into products. So it's 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 nice thing, uh, uh, these global companies can really get that level of visibility, but they might be making a garment and doing it very sustainably, but then they buy a cotton reel. Yeah. Where'd that cotton come from? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and currently, if I'm, a, if I'm the end producer of that cotton, I might be very willing to record that data, but if I'm not part of the same organization as my customer, where do I record that data in a way that takes into account the amount of trading that can happen in between? And that's perhaps where these more permanent records. I, I, I suppose, you know, and this is a question that, 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 that that's coming in from 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 the audience. Um, but but when it comes to thinking about maintaining the data standards around that, when you've got that coordination problem of a, of a thousand small firms trying to agree how they should be recording the data on each individual cotton reel they're producing before it goes in and gets traded and shipped around and finally ends up inside a garment factory. I, I don't know who you see as, as providing uh, the, the centralization and coordination function there and helping guide those people together, but that must be a real challenge. Yeah, I mean, the, you're really getting into the, the absolute questions we need to address. And um, the other, you know, there, there's the, the data standards. Um, and this is where I think some of the larger firms, you know, and in, are and can take a lead because you know if, if if the very large clothing manufacturers or retailers say no what common data standard this is it working with iso agree a standard and say right this is how it's done and um, so that that can be done and you know that, that's where the companies i think will will be playing a role um a more salient perhaps you know i can see how you can do that the problem is who's going to pay um and this is where you get into some politics and who's going to pay for this because we've seen with sort of the fair trade certification sort of uh marks that it's always it's become a market in itself and we've seen that or you know talking to to experts in this area, uh, like slavery trade, uh, or talking to them and they're saying, well, there's become a market for these certified bodies. And then that market then pushes price down. So people are competing to be cheaper. And when you push price down, you audit less often, or you suddenly start paying people less. And then you, you, you're getting a mark. And what does that mark mean? Yeah. If that farm's been audited, maybe you know, by somebody you paid minimum wage to go and look at it three years ago. So I think there's maybe a case for some form of global government regulation. Um, somebody needs to lead the way and champion this. And I think it's likely to be some large firms. And I know most of the large firms are actually really, you know, we, we spoke about Cabris and, you know, Tony's Chocoloni is quite a, a well known for championing this. Most of the chocolate firms are really trying, but we need to do more. It's not good enough to accept this. Uh, this day and age, why do we say, well, it, it exists in the supply chain? It shouldn't. So if we start from it mustn't exist, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, if Black Lives Matter, let's solve this problem. Um, because it tends to be, uh, you know, modern Western countries, you wouldn't tolerate that so much here. Though recently, of course, we, we've seen this sort of practice even going on, the, the recent case in the news in Leicester on garment manufacture. So it, it's, it's ever present and it needs to be addressed.
And I, and I, and I think there, and, and, I, and I do want to, to, after this point, sort of get back to seeing how that change can be brought about. But I, I, I think on that topic of, of, of whether it's Leicester, or I remember earlier this week when we were talking, and I don't know if you'd want to, to share the, the same story again here, but sharing a pretty horrific anecdote around you know, some of the things that have happened on fair trade certified farms in some instances in, in, in remoter parts of, of Ghana and West Africa where, where scrutiny is, is very logistically difficult. Um, but, but that prime problem seems to remain, that, that at the end of the day, if, if a sweatshop in Leicester is recording its garments as having been made ethically, if a, a fair trade style certification has been handed out um, to, to a farm that has then started cheating and playing the game of saying, we're probably not going to get audited for another two or three years, you know, the blockchain approach doesn't actually solve that problem at all. This remains a problem of you know, there are some parts of the world where it is very difficult to see what's going on minute by minute, day by day, and people can hide things. Is, 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 is that fair? And I, and, I, and I think if you're willing to share a couple of the, the examples that you, you shared earlier, that, that might help you at home. But. Yeah, I mean, obviously, fair trade is a particular certification organization. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not meaning to, to criticize fair trade as, as an organization, capital F, fair trade with a small f. Yeah, with a small, uh, it's these certification bodies who are, you know, maybe competing and, you know, they're all, I can see, I, I always believe in, you know, these people are really good people trying to do good things. And yet, uh, I think at the higher levels we're, or even at the consumer level, we turn a blind eye to it, we're not prepared to pay for it. And then when you talk to you know, border agents and or, one one uh, person I was talking to, he, he was saying, you know, I, I was on a certified farm and stepping over a dead body and there was slavery there. And you're like, oh, how is that possible? And he said, no, you know, we, we were involved in saving people who were in, you know, forced labor. That, that is going on and that's appalling. And absolutely, we should all care and want to address it. And, you know, this is, again, what my, my, my colleagues are really, that's their deep-seated passion. And when, once you sort of move into that, even though I'm, I'm more on the supply chain, blockchain process side, you can't help but say, well, you know, if, if, if my work's going to mean something, yeah, absolutely, I want to get into that. And the, I think it's one of those questions when the companies are with you, the governments are with you, mm. but when you really, really start to get into it, it's not easy. I think, and then this maybe shows the the politics of the different people in the audience. We've got we've got some people tossing forward uh, questions around. Well, shouldn't this be consumers ultimately paying more the way they're willing to pay, you know, a premium for green and black chocolate, for example? And we've got other people saying, you know, this is this is exactly why we're paying taxes. Shouldn't the regulated be <laughs> the people imposing these costs on companies? Um, and so. Uh, you, you've touched on on one model of, of how this change can be brought about. It could be if regulators work with large firms to develop standards that smaller firms are then required to input data you know, following to a blockchain that allows that trading record to be developed. Um, is there no hope for this coming from a from a consumer pressure? Are, are consumers maybe in 10 years' time going to be saying, I only want to be buying my products if they come with a blockchain supply chain certified label on it? Or is that terribly naive of, of the more libertarian people among us? Um, I'm, I'm, I, I, my personal belief, I suppose we're getting into, you know, this isn't academically strong, uh, but my belief is if we can put this supply chain visibility uh, information out there and you know, make it a story and say, if you can't scan this code, and see all, all, all this, there's a problem. And why would you want to eat a chocolate bar that may perhaps have this problem in its supply chain? And, you know, it's, when I spoke about, you know, solving the chocolate problem, I was speaking to a, a chocolate manufacturer, because yeah, it's, it's a big problem. We've, we're trying really hard and we've got this, this and this. And they said, you know, there's a bigger problem with the sugar. <laughs> I was like, oh, what? <laughs> he said, oh yeah, sugar's terrible. <laughs> so, I'm like, oh gosh, okay. Uh, I was just dealing with the cocoa beans, but there's sugar as well. Um, so they're, you know, they're aware and they're trying to deal with it. But yeah, consumer pressure. If people just said, no, I'm not going to buy it unless you can prove to me that it's safe. Um, and I'd love to see that. But then you'd also got to think, what am I wearing? You know, what are my clothes? Where did that come from? Is it ethical? You know, I, I just bought, uh, I'm 
quite into clothes. You might not look like it, but I am. I just, I just bought a, <laughs> I just bought a new Guernsey jumper, and I know, you know, that was wool grown on the island and knitted by people on the island, and that's like, yeah, I'm happy with that. That's right. But other things, you know, you just how how do you know? And can we provide that provenance using digital technologies uh, to make sure we don't get this? this problem. I, I suppose just on, on some of those data visibility aspects and, and stepping back a bit from, from the social change that, that people want to see and that's driving a lot of this, um, it, it strikes me that with a lot of these multi-organizational supply chains, you know, one of the uh, trust problems that prevent these records being collected on centralized databases without the use of blockchain today is that if I came along as Unilever and said to everyone, hey, can you just input stuff into my database and we'll scrutinize it? I'm probably gonna say, hang on, I'm not comfortable with you having that data, I'm a small independent supplier. Not to mention the fact that Unilever might say, hang on, this is gonna be terribly expensive for us to run with a centralized database. Um, however, with a public blockchain and, and, and for the reasons that you outlined in the technical piece, you can, you can well see why you know, that makes a lot more sense than one that's just been run by one organization. For, for, a, for a public blockchain, you've, you've also got the challenge of I as a small supplier might be saying, I don't necessarily want my competitor to know what I'm uploading, or um, I, I might not want my government to know exactly how much money I'm making, particularly if I'm in a part of the world where I'm worried about being shaken down um, by, by, by local government people who, who, who maybe aren't as, 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 as rule abiding as you'd wish. Um, and, and so those questions around, it's a very different kind of trust but that trust that the information that's going to be recorded on a public blockchain isn't going to harm the underlying business of the people who are who are uploading it. I'd be really curious to hear your reflections on that. Well, that that's um, that's what we can solve <clears throat> because when you think about what do we put onto the, the blockchain, and we have to be really careful not to put anything that's revealing, no personal data, because you think about GDPR, you can't put personal data on the blockchain. Um, but what do you actually load? Well, if I have a document, I might have a, an invoice. <clears throat> I can make a PDF of that document and I can hash it. And then I could just put the hash of the document on the blockchain. So then when somebody goes, you, you did a transaction. Yes, I did. Here's my transaction document to an auditor or somebody's asking me. I show them the PDF. And they say, well, how do we know that's a valid document? <clears throat> well, there it is at a point in time on the blockchain hashed. And it matches with that. If I train, try and change that document, the hash no longer works. And also, <clears throat> if I want that to you know, disappear, I can change my document myself. Then it doesn't match. Or I can just delete my document. And then you've just got a dead hash sitting on a chain somewhere. I, I suppose just to, and this is my shortfall I think but I mean in that instance where you have a blockchain that's recording hashes that refer to, to physical documents that can be lost um, or, or destroyed um, if, if, if not changed without being lost or destroyed um, then when it comes to audit I can see that gives you confidence that the document you're seeing hasn't necessarily been changed but it doesn't necessarily make it that much easier for someone much further down the chain to track back provenance unless they know who to go and talk to about seeing the underlying document. If I'm, if I'm a consumer facing organization and I want to be able to give them an aggregated stat on where exactly the thread of cotton in their shirt came from, knowing that who are that cotton producer won't have been able to change their document when talking to their auditor doesn't necessarily make my life easier in, in linking it back, unless I'm missing something. Is that fair? You know, these are, are some of the, the challenges and, and some of the solutions we've seen are having multi-layered blockchains <laughs> where you have a public layer and a shared layer and a private layer. So you end up with stacked layers of information. So there are all sorts of systems, but ultimately you, you still have that, you know, it comes back to one of the problems, which is what do you make visible? What don't you make visible? And how do you link, you know, data from the real world into this digital world? Gotcha. Well, look, I'm, I'm aware of time. So I think we've probably only got time for me to chuck you one more question. Um, but it's some of the examples you shared, people like AgriDigital, people like TechRock and Demeter, um, really, really fascinating. But, but all of them, I... I think seeming to be focused initially 
much more on, on one particular sector in one particular place and, and, and maybe in a slightly narrow way. And I, and I was just curious as to whether you saw efforts emerging either spontaneously or through government action around the world that are trying to do more of that coordination function within different industries. Um, and, and, and so if people here are interested in going out and looking at this develop in the field, you know, which movements should they be looking to? Which industries do you think are leading the way? Oh, um, it's quite a lot of really interesting work going on. Um, I, I spoke to a company the other day called Mind Spider, and they're looking at minerals. Um, and I think it was Volkswagen Group, so making sure that the 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 materials put in their batteries is is sort of safe, slave free, free of abuse. Um, <clears throat> then, so there's a lot of work in you know the big companies are looking at how can I make this more robust. So, so minerals, diamonds, there's been a lot of work on because uh, there's lots of challenges with these big global supply chains. Food is a big one. <clears throat> and wine as well, we, we're looking at a case uh, at the moment, moving wine from Australia around the world. <clears throat> and how can you use, I mean, this is a customs and excise question, really. Um, <clears throat> so how, how do you make sure that can move more quickly through the supply chain? So that's a really interesting case. If we can get multiple governments to agree the data standards, then that, that shipment can move more quickly through ports because you can go, yeah, <clears throat> it's certified, there's its credentials, we can move it through. And then, then when you're, you're looking at questions around, say, the Irish border um, <clears throat> or, you know, a new EU border issues and all the documentation you require, if you can put these systems in place, the various governments and particularly the departments within government that deal with, with taxes and, and, and border crossing can, can have these systems. And I think, you know, there's, there's big commercial benefits there for, for that. That's absolutely fascinating. And, and your answer was concise enough. I think I'm going to be able to sneak in a follow up just around that, that cross border audit. Um, so, so just to really pull out and, and help me understand exactly how that helps speed things up. You know, those are instances where because the, the certification documents earlier in the chain have been hashed, I might be more willing to trust um, the, the document I'm being shown is correct and not require them to go through the same kind of inspection audit process I normally would when they come across my border. I'll be happier to say, look, if, if the Australians gave you that certificate, I'm pretty confident that's not a fake Australian certificate. And so my bar to inspecting your, your produce is just lowered significantly. But that's the... Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> to move stuff across the border, uh, you can move towards trusted status as a shipper. And as you get more trusted, uh, you know, you, you get various uh, certifications and things, um, <clears throat> then your your product flows more more, more effectively. You know, it's, it's, you're going to get stopped if you're a one off lorry just turning up and saying, oh, I've got stuff in the back. Here's some bits of paper never seen you before. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but if you've got this sort of if you can tap into this certification process, you can accelerate all of that because you can turn up and say, here it is. It's all logged, verified, audited, and then at the board and go, okay, we recognize the system you're using and we trust that. So we can now move goods rapidly around and know that, you know, yeah, we can move that from there to there. We're okay with that. You can't move it into there, but, you know, that, that system then really helps. It, it's, it's that, I think, you know, that's where we can really start to realize the idea of trust as perception of trust being improved using these sort of technical systems. Well, look, Fred, that, that has been absolutely fascinating um, for me and, 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 and for everyone else here. So thank you so much for, for the time. I feel like I've moved, I've moved maybe not 20% forwards, but 10% forwards. And that's, that's a wonderful thing to do first thing on a Saturday morning. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Thank you for, for, for agreeing to doing this quite early in the day. Um, and uh, yeah, th thank you everyone for coming.